Welcome to Voices of Resistance. You are listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with a global soul. The viewpoints expressed in the preceding program are in, excuse me, we're not proceeding yet. The following program are not necessarily those of WRUU, its license holder or its staff. I'm Barbara Humphrey, co-host of today's show, Voices of Resistance. And I'm Albert Strickland, co-host of today's show. Voices of Resistance is a project of the Savannah Justice and Peace Collective. We give voice to those who have no voice in mainstream media and present a wide, wide range of issues that affect us all. As you listen, please think about the Voices of Resistance you would like to hear on this show and email us at voicesofresistance at gmail.com or visit our Facebook page and leave us a comment. Today we start with the first verse of a song called My Country. My country tis of thee, sweet land of poverty. For thee I weep, land where my mother cried, land where my father died, sweet land of genocide, pride of my heart. The above lines are they're actually from a song written by an artist named Nako. He's an indigenous artist, artist and it's in uh, Medicine for the People, and it's sung to the tune of My Country Tis of Thee. So it's uh, not lo- well. So you've guessed probably that today's program is based on poverty and the causes of poverty, who, what, when, and where, we hope to get into. Um, not long ago at a local event, uh, a political candidate, we were showing a movie, uh, was it in attendance of this movie? It was a political time when the attendance pop up everywhere. So we were. De- it was pro- talking about problems within the U.S., including poverty and war and all the the general things. And during the question and answer period following this movie, he stood up, and raised his hand. So we said, "Okay," and he said, "Yes, we have all these problems, but we're the richest country in the world." And I looked at him and said, "Yes." That is true. We are the richest country in the world. I don't think anyone can deny that. But the people are not. And he sat down. That was it. Why in the richest country in the world are 15% of us, or 43 million, living at or below the poverty level? And an additional 97 million more are categorized by the United States as at or below the level called low income. How can that be? Nearly half of us, 45%, are at or below that low-income level. We have the power of numbers, but we control so much less of the resources, the wealth. We did a little calculation earlier, and any of you are mathematicians out there, and you find (laughs) corrections, um, please let us know. But we were looking at the whole pie, 100% of the pie, and 1% owning 40% of the pie leaving 60% of the pie for the rest of us 99 percenters. If the pie were divided, if that um, 60% were divided equally, we calculated that we would each get 0.6%, six-tenths of 1%. And we know that pie is not equally distributed because we know that of that 99%, there are the nearly rich and the upper middle class who definitely take way more of their fair share, leaving practically nothing for the rest of us. So while we may not have calculated accurately because our math skills are not that good, but we do know that we control very little of the wealth, and anyone out there, I'm sure, you're feeling the same thing we are. And thus, if we don't control any of the wealth or very little of it, we have very little power in the society. So how can that be in the richest country in the world that there is this... Uh, such division between the rich and the poor. So we thought we might start with the question, what is poverty? And then why are there so many poor people in this richest country in the world? According to the statement by our political, our political candidate mentioned above, what is poverty? We looked at a number of formal definitions, but then we decided to just make a list of what we perceive poverty to be. And we talked to a few people too. And here is our list. Number one, 
Being without adequate resources to meet your basic needs of food, clothing, and shelter. Number two, being one paycheck or less away from not having adequate resources to meet your even basic needs. Number three, being homeless or a new term that I learned this week, being precariously housed. Being unable to meet any unexpected expenses like par- the parking tickets that happen to especially work downtown in Savannah. And with all these new rules and regulations going in, if you work downtown, you're likely to get one. A ticket or a car repair, or if, if that is if you're fortunate enough to even own a car. Illness, that means choosing between medicine and other essentials like food, not being able to enroll your kids in activities at school, or, um, and, well, there's just so much more. Right. Living in the street, living under a bridge, or another situation where you don't have access to fresh water, sewer, or power, or living in your parents' homes, or friends' couches, or floors, porches, etc. Feeling powerless and at the mercy of others, and are the system, including the police, ICE, public welfare agencies, most, if not all, of the time. Any one or a combination of the above spell poverty, and it isn't pretty. One of the things that we've uh, noticed is that there are a lot of rich who like to talk poverty. You know, they, they, they think that they have the solution. To me, they're the cause, but let's talk about what they think. The rich talk about poverty while they wear their $12,000 jackets, as during the last election, wearing $10,000 suits at dinners costing up to $1,000 a plate, all the while talking about poverty as though they know something about it. And those who might, and I mean might, have come from a background of poverty, uh, if they remember anything at all, it's, it's very little because they certainly don't show that in their actions. So it's very, uh, they, they long ago forgot what it's like to be poor. Absolutely. So we thought we would start out asking the questions, why is there poverty in a first world, resource-rich country like the U.S., and where we find the greater extremes of poverty. So if 14.5% or 45.3 million people in the U.S. are living in poverty, and the additional 97.3 million living at low income or lower, they've calculated the um, income as low income or lower at 47,700 for a family of four. For many of you listening, that seems like an awful lot. But when you start looking at the cost of food, clothing, shelter, particularly for four people, it's, it's really a not. But so many people are not even making that amount of money. But for many people, that would be income for two families. That's right. And then while the national poverty rate is 14.5%, we discovered that the rate for the state of Georgia is 19%, fifth among the worst in the nation. Nearly one-third of residents in Savannah are at or below the poverty level. We, We found a 2013 article from the Savannah Morning News that put the city's poverty rate at 28.6%. And from what we've seen from other poverty statistics, it surely is getting worse every year, not better. Now, there are agencies in Savannah, both city and uh, otherwise, that they work together to help solve this problem of poverty, supposedly poverty and uh, homelessness. We tried to contact two of them, one the city and one not. Uh, We got a runaround. I left messages, please call us back. We need to talk to you. We need help in figuring this thing out because we want to present an accurate picture of the situation of poverty about poverty here in Savannah. We couldn't get the help. Contacted the city and they said, no, we don't know anything. You've got to talk to these other guys. So we just, uh, we, we're going to do a lot more in this area because Savannah is very much in poverty and we need to find a solution, a way to get out of it and Who's the problem? And it's not just an educational system or a job system. And we'll get into that a little bit later, too. So, Right. And we know that numbers tell one story, but people's experiences tell a very different story. We, many of us have had times in our lives that have been harder than others where we have experienced poverty. As a single mother, I can remember many na- nights staying awake trying to figure out which bills to pay, which ones would have to wait for the next month 
whether or not I could get the car repaired and how I was going to possibly purchase groceries. My solution, I was, I was fortunate. I was privileged. I could get credit. So I wound up running up an extreme amount of credit card debt just to stay even, just to feed my kids, pay, pay the bills, and barely survive. For others, it's very different. I think we all have our own experiences like this. I remember uh, when I'd go to a new city while I'm look, waiting and looking for a job, uh, sometimes before I find that job, which I was fortunate, I was in that time a waiter, so I could go almost anywhere and get a job. But it did take time. So by the time I took my resources, I paid my rent, I bought whatever I needed uh, in clothing or anything specially for this job, and find myself from time to time. I know none of you have ever done this before, but where you had to look for change throughout the house so you could catch the bus to work or to look for work. And there was no help. There was no one who could say, hey, I'm there, contact me, and I'll be more than helpful, willing to help you. So I think we've all had our, our experiences, uh, the times when we, exp- we, we feel disassociated from the society, the society in which we're living because of the economic condition that we find ourselves in. And the thing that bugs me about this is that while we're struggling like this, there are people out there that have 40, 50 billion dollars tucked away in bank accounts all across across the world while children here are going to bed hungry at night while people are having their utilities turned off and it just goes on and on and on this disparity between the rich and the poor is it's, it's got to end i mean there's just no other way to, to put it absolutely and one of the things that always struck me about those times in my life when i really did not have resources was the sense of powerlessness, Uh the sense that I was barely one paycheck away from losing a home, not being able to get food at the grocery, not being able to buy gas. Um, And it's probably just my personality, but that anxiety was was quite difficult to deal with. And um, my heart goes out to people that I see who I know are engaged in those same kinds of struggles. Have you noticed that I don't know if it's picking up more or not, but it seems to be. Maybe it's the time of year and more people are out. But whether it's here or Washington, D.C. or New York City where we've been recently or Asheville, people are constantly coming up and saying, I'm hungry. Do you have any extra change? And this is not the normal that you normally would see. This is a lot of people, and not all of them are um, necessarily... Uh, just begging. These are people that are actually in need for uh, a cup of coffee, a, a meal, or someone to talk to, and there's nothing there provided. So uh, I carry. I don't carry change. I guess we're going to have to start doing that because all I have is the card. Well, you can't exactly, they don't exactly have a means of processing my debit card so that I could give them $5 or whatever it needs. And I, I think we need to start realizing that, that all these people that come up, we tend to shun them. But uh, it takes a lot of courage to walk up to someone and ask for help. He, you know, it, it really does. Yeah, that, that is absolutely the truth. And we know that the face and the place of poverty are changing. I go back to the Reagan administration in the 1980s when there were, it, it seemed to me that that was the beginning of what I saw as the cuts in our so-called safety net system when we saw housing assistance, um, food assistance in terms of food stamps, the SNAP program, and health care, Medicaid, when we saw the cutbacks begin in all of those programs. But clearly, that continued throughout the years. I can't think of any president, at least since the 1980s on, who made who attempted or made any substantial changes to make life better for poor people. Not even President Clinton. But um, also, you know, it's back as far as the 1960s, um, 1970s, 1980s. Dr. Martin Luther King recognized that poverty is perhaps a major issue across the, the U.S., and it, it goes across all races. Uh, as he said, you know, a poor person is a poor person, and we have a lot of them white uh, that's what he, the Poor People's Campaign was designed to bring poverty, people in poverty together so that we could actually make some demands and do something. 
Uh, the Poor People's Campaign was supposed to get people from White Appalachia, people from the indigenous, uh, people from uh, Hispanic, uh, blacks, all together. In fact, he was doing this. It was working. That is a great fear to rich people that actually when, when we can organize and we can do something, they tend to shake in their boots a bit. Right. And he, he um, made some interesting statements about poverty. Um, in terms of militarism, he made a statement that the bombs dropped in Vietnam took food off the plates of children in the U.S., and can you just imagine how much more true that is today with the global unending wars, the cost of bombs and drones, at millions upon millions of dollars? Just imagine if all that money on militarism could be putting food on the table, could be helping people afford the basic essentials and so much more to have a quality standard of living. So think about it. Every time a bullet flies or a bomb drops, a millionaire runs to the bank and a child starves. Uh, all this money could be redirected to the sources that we all need, um, the resources. Uh, we're working with the children's program at the library here in Savannah. And the library is so hampered for funding. They're thinking about closing libraries. In fact, this has been an ongoing program problem for a long time because I remember when they were trying to close the libraries and they'd open this one only a day a week or two days a week. And I think some of the branches have closed. I know the one, I think the one down on Broughton on um, Bay Street has by the city hall there. But uh, we, we need these these. Uh, centers for education or for books and for reading and for people getting together. This program uh, for children through this library is a phenomenal program. It works uh, works wonders, and I'm amazed by it. But they need resources, and they say, we don't have it. Our budgets are cut so low already. And they're even taking, as teachers have to, they're even taking money out of their pockets to buy some of the things that they need to make this program work. I have a friend who's a teacher. Every year she has to spend hundreds of dollars out of her own pocket because the funding isn't there for the supplies that the children need. And yet we have money to bomb Afghanistan all the way up through Syria. We have money for all these bombs and missiles and not the money for our own children and our educational system and our libraries and our roads and the things that we need as a society. We're too busy destroying all these societies in other countries to actually take care of our own society and build it where we can actually benefit from it. Recently, we visited Huntsville, Alabama, which is now being called the Pentagon of the South. So Huntsville is a space center, and so embedded in the space center is the military. It was appalling to us. Not only did we drive through rural areas in Georgia and Alabama that you could tell just by looking were relatively impoverished. And then suddenly you come out of the hills to this city, which, uh, you know, it's, it's amazing in how much wealth you can see in this one place with military contractors with huge buildings, huge establishments. In fact, we went into one business park where I think there were like three or four banks and credit unions. So it told us that there are an awful lot of people with money for that many banks and credit unions to be there. Uh, we also learned that the costs of outfitting a single modern soldier for war costs more than many families make in a year. Absolutely. That was quite a shock. You know, I'm, they it was in the building. Well, that was the NASA building? Yes, I believe NASA, it was the NASA, uh, yeah, the Space Center. So we're walking through this, and they've got all this uh, equipment and all these things that they're spending billions and billions of dollars on, and all these defense contractors, Northrop and, and uh, all of them all around the area of just raking in the money on war and on death and destruction. And then we come upon this display, and there is this outfitted mannequin in the latest gear and i can't remember the exact figure it sounds like something like eighteen thousand dollars just to outfit him in this uniform one soldier that is more than many of us make in a year's time so uh you know if, if you're on social security and you're at the lower level of it the most you can make is like seven eight thousand dollars a year or so you know and so that not enough to live on and it takes three times that to outfit a soldier but no one cares about the person 
that really needs the help, we're more interested in outfitting this um, person to go over and kill people. But that's beyond the subject, I guess. We'll get into that one later, we'll, too. We'll get into that. <laughs> so Dr. Martin Luther King, when he started really focusing attention on poverty, this was after his I Have a Dream speech. This was after... Um, you know, th- this was when we were well on our way to um, passage of the Civil Rights Act. And he made what I thought was an incredibly powerful statement. When, you know, when we were taking Jim Crow laws down, he asked, what use was it to gain the right to sit at the lunch counter when you could not afford to buy a burger? That's a very important part. No need to sit there, is there? Um, I, I do know that... When we're talking about this this particular issue, uh, poverty or not having enough money to survive uh, or to barely survive, it puts a lot of pressure on people, a lot of pressure on families. Uh, I'm surprised at school. We recently had uh, friends of ours who graduated from school. The last week of school cost $120 or else you couldn't participate in anything. You had to go... Uh, be with the, uh, ele- uh, what was it, the first grade students anyway, or so, right. rather than with your class, which is graduating, because you didn't have $120, you're punished. A lot of the events at the school, I've noticed even last year, they sent out a teacher appreciation day, and they gave a list of what you were supposed to give to appreciate your teachers. And it's like this was around Thanksgiving, I think, and it was whole turkeys and all this stuff, and people are having difficulty putting that on their own tables to eat. So this unconcern for the needs of the poor, even in areas that are, which this school and all, most of the students go there, live in the area where there's there's, there's a lot of poverty. Uh, The expectations are too high, and that puts a lot of pressure on the students. It puts a lot of pressure on uh, the family. You you just, it's mentally and socially, it's, it's restrictive, so... Yeah, we saw kids graduating from kindergarten to first grade. (laughs) Wearing caps and gowns, even. Caps and gowns. And um, then the graduation that we attended was fifth grade, apparently to middle school, sixth grade. All the girls had to have white dresses. And um, I'm sure the boys had special things they were supposed to wear. And I could think about poor people. How do you, how do you, Outfit your kids, particularly in something they'll wear once, probably never wear again, and here they are barely able to meet their basic costs of living. It just felt so obscene to us that our public school systems would be putting those kinds of pressures on families in a city where the poverty rate is upwards of 30%. There used to be a time when the poverty areas were definitely inner city. And when you moved out to the suburbs, you were moving out into now what was becoming middle America. But today it seems that that is shifting rapidly. The inner city uh, residents are being pushed out into the suburbs. Um, And this is a process of gentrification, urban development, whatever you want to call it. But the process is where the, the wealthy begin to take over the properties and upgrade and the people who lived there their whole lives in many instances can no longer live there because they can't afford the taxes much less the the rent and the utilities and everything else that goes along with it so this this process is very dangerous uh, very uh, crippling to a lot of people and a lot of these people who are moving to these outer rings of the city or the inner rings of the suburban areas have far less access to services and transportation. They're being uprooted from their communities. They may leave other family members behind, or not everybody goes to the same place. The difficulty in finding housing. I mean, one of the things that I remember from those poor days was how difficult it was to move. Every place you go, you have to have first month's rent and an additional month's rent as your security deposit. Most of us barely had enough money for one month's rent. Let it, ha- let it alone have two months in your pocket to spend. And then, of course, there were the costs of moving. And the deposits. Don't forget the, deposits, the deposits for the electricity or for the yes. gas or for the water or whatever it is. So Very true. Yeah. Very true. So I think we've 
made a compelling case that yes, there is extreme poverty in this richest country, and certainly in this very beautiful city that is a tourist destination for many people. And we, we talked a little bit, we thought a little bit, we researched a little bit. The causes of poverty, why is there poverty? Who are the perpetrators of poverty <laughs> in this country? And, yeah. and really that was a that phrase that was new to us, perpetrators of poverty. You know, because when you think about it, it makes sense. We have victims of poverty, so we must have some perpetration or a perpetrator of these, or a group of perpetrators. Uh, perhaps you can think of who they might be or what they might be. And in case you can't think, we'll, we'll give you a little clue. How about the rich as a cause of poverty? <laughs> Imagine that. Wealth inequality. Wealth concentrated in the hands of a few. We have statistics that the rich 1% hold about 38% of all privately held wealth in the U.S. The bottom 90% hold about 73 of all the debt. And we can all imagine that. Um, very few of us are not in debt at these, at these times. Uh, we saw a New York Times article that the richest 1% now own more wealth than the bottom 90%. The gap between the top 10% and the middle class is over 1,000%. You know, all these figures and all these percentages and all, they get mind-boggling at times, and you lose sight of what it's really trying to say. So what it's really trying to say is the poor in this country are in deep trouble. And until we realize that, we can't work together to solve the problems that face all uh, people who are in poverty. My grandmother um, grew up, of course, uh, she was born in the 1890s, so she was very raising her own family when the Depression came. And so they suffered greatly because being in the South at that time, we had still not fully recovered from the effects of even the, the war that was, what, 70 years previous to yes. that. So living out in the country, you were a sharecropper, so you were really down already. And she said, you know, the, the one salvation for them is that they grew food so they didn't have to worry about starving to death totally, although there were times when it was very, very little to, to have. But um, they didn't have debt. They had no credit cards, so they couldn't go to the store and buy all this stuff and then wonder how am I going to pay for it. You either had it or you didn't, and that was then the face of poverty, whereas now poverty is hidden behind credit cards, behind all this debt. Uh, it, it's not only we, we, we have all become uh, slaves to wage, wage slavery, now we're also slave, enslaved by debt. If all the debts that all of us, on, if you for instance, if all your debts had to come due tomorrow, could you pay them? If you can't pay them, you are in poverty. I don't care how much money you have. So the idea that we cover this poverty under the illusion of wealth I can go buy what I need. I can get that color TV right now. No problem about it. I'm going to put it on my credit card. It's only $50 a month for the next 20 years. And the interest rates go up. Well, guess who's making money off that again by that expenditure, for you, whatever it is, things that you desperately need, even like car repairs and medical bills and things. It puts you in slavery for a long time because now you have the interest to pay. Who makes money? the rich. They go to the bank off your suffering. So one interesting thing that we looked at was wealth versus income. And before we get into that discussion, we are going to identify our station, and then we are going to um, give you a word from our sponsor, Brighter Day, and also let you know about an upcoming auction to raise money for the station. So you are listening to WRUULP, Savannah, Georgia, 107.5 FM, WRUU.org. We are Savannah Soundings, community radio with a global soul. Apparently, we um, seem to have lost our sponsor, um, our sponsor message. We're going to work on getting that back for you. So let's just move on with our discussion of wealth and income. We typically talk about um, we typically talk about the disparities in income. We um, talk about the CEO of a company making three or four hundred times more than his workers, and um, certainly 
that affords this CEO the opportunity to accumulate wealth. So wealth is the value of the stuff you own, less your debt. And clearly, the more you earn, the more wealth you can accumulate. I started thinking about that in terms of my family, who came over here in the early 1900s, who were on bread lines during the Depression in New York City, and yet, after 70 years, managed to accumulate at least enough wealth, or not even 70 years, much less than that, 40 years, managed to accumulate enough wealth to send three of their four children to college, to assist one of their children to buy a home, to pass, to have the wealth for vacations, for a boat, for automobiles, and also to pass wealth on to their children. I contrast that with people whose families did not have that opportunity. What gave my family the opportunity to accumulate wealth, in my opinion, was the GI Bill that enabled them to buy a house at no interest, practically practically free to be able to borrow money to buy their first home, which they could then turn into a second home and a third home, and the equity in that home to be used as part of the accumulation of wealth. So when we look at wealth, we look at um, the richest 10% of US, U.S. households earning about 20% of o overall income, but owning 76% of all wealth in America. And really what we have here is a wealth disparity. And what we know is money makes money. So if you have wealth, you can invest, you can take advantage, and that's in quotes, of opportunities to increase your wealth. And as we see, as we look around, at least what I see is that people with money seem obsessed with continually making more money and making more money and driving public policy that enables them to continue to make more money at the expense, definitely at the expense of the poor. Every time I see a new development, housing development, shopping center, mall, and the developer comes in and asks for tax breaks, well, guess where he gets those tax breaks? What he doesn't pay in taxes, other people pay in taxes because it's coming from somewhere. So here we have public policy, the GI Bill and more, that enabled certain people to accumulate wealth and then for that wealth to continue to accumulate while there were people who are barely getting by. So while the average wealth has increased over the past 50 years, it's not grown equally for all groups. Families near the bottom of the wealth distribution system went from having no wealth on average to being about $2,000 in debt. And we just talked about debt and what that means psychologically when you have limited income and you're not sure which bills you're gonna pay. While those in the middle category double their wealth and clearly the families at the top saw their wealth quadruple. And it's this wealth that, again, is, is growing wealth and increasing the disparities. It's a, it's a difficult subject to talk about wealth. You know, what, what does it mean for a lot of us? Um, most of us have no idea. We, we go by like uh, World War II uh, when we had all these American movies and the world thought that the streets were paved with gold and all the... The, the houses were just immaculate, and it was the way everything was. But it didn't work that way. Uh, that wasn't reality. It was a Hollywood presentation. So when we think about wealth today, we've deluded ourselves also with that same thing, that same idea that wealth has this particular image. Actually, wealth doesn't have that image. Uh, it's a very greedy, very difficult image. Ours, most of us live very, very normal lives, deep in poverty, deep in debt, uh, having to worry about getting to work the next day so that we can uh, make money just to survive. Uh, that's uh, an image that's not presented. I, re I remember growing up, everything had to be like Donna Reed, and I know most of you don't know who that was, but it was this household where everything was perfect. and. Daddy went off to work and brought all the money home. Uh, Mama stayed home, and, and she looked beautiful and perfect and not a hair out of place, and she had all this time and money to run around and do all these things. 
Well, most of us didn't live that life, and uh, it was a, a, a bad thing that was done to us by these people presenting this image. Most life is, uh, for us, pretty mundane and, and uh, popular. Hold on one moment. Dave's out there if you get him about the thing here. Okay, yes. Well, that is very, very true. But before we <laughs> go beyond income disparity, which breeds wealth, which breeds even more disparity, to some of the other causes of racism, I want to try again to um, give you a word from our sponsor. And I apologize if it's nothing but blank air. We will, um, we will move on to our conversation of poverty. This portion of WRUULP Savannah Soundings programming is made possible by a grant from Brighter Day Natural Foods, offering produce, vitamins, and supplements, and a deli and juice bar. Brighter Day is located at 1102 Bull Street at the south end of Forsyth Park. More information available at 912-236-4703 or brighterdayfoods.com. WRUU is now collecting items for the annual Savannah Soundings fundraising auction. The auction will run from July 15th to July 30th, with proceeds going to WRUU to continue providing both great music and a voice for the Savannah community. Auction items range from gift cards to vouchers for products and services that are guaranteed to delight and surprise. Tell everyone you know about donating and about the auction. Donations can be made now. For information on donation, contact Trent Kissinger at T-A-K-I-S-S-I-N-G-E-R at gmail.com. So welcome back to Voices of Resistance. These are your co-hosts, Barbara Humphrey and Albert Strickland, talking poverty. I am so glad that we were able to get our sponsors our sponsor announcement mm -hmm. to work, as well as the announcement about the auction, because in fact, as we're talking about money, I hope you realize we're listening to a relatively new community radio station without any corporate sponsorship that runs on the generosity of you, the listeners, and everybody in the city. It's a valuable resource for us all, and I hope you will consider making a donation supporting the station. Even consider having a show. It's really a lot of fun. It, it can be. It's also a little, a little bit of work. I think a little more than we, we thought at first. These things require a lot of research, and when you get boggled down into uh, the problem, whatever the problem is that you're trying to present, you realize that these problems are actually interconnected. There is no such thing as the standalone problem. It seems to work with others. So the, the poverty issue, it's a, a major problem, but yet it's also a part of our corporate structure. It's part of our military budgeting, our government. I, I know that during the 30s in particular, uh, Roosevelt p built this massive, uh, uh, what did you call it? Um, public works public program. Public works, where actually, yeah, it was uh, these safety net. Oh, the know? safety net, The right. safety net. And the safety, the safety net, net means net. to catch you when you fall. Well, since that was in place, you can watch year by year by year, administration by administration by administration, quietly, often, sometimes not so quietly, dismantling it, taking it apart. Who benefits from taking that apart? We the poor people don't. Those who need those services don't. Those who depend on their services so that their family can eat, uh, they don't benefit. So who actually benefits? These are questions we need to be asking ourselves. You know, I'm, I'm kind of tired of the people who say, well, it's your fault if you're poor. You need to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Well, what happens if they take your boots? You have no straps. Then what are you going to pull yourself up by? And pull yourself up to what? You know, the the idea that uh, society is built upon this massive need of a very few to grow strong and, and vibrant off the backs of the majority of the poor people, it's it's really a, it's unimaginable that they can actually live with themselves. I, I, I often ask myself, and I know everybody that knows me heard me say it, how is it that a person who has a million dollars in the bank about 20 million, how about a billion dollars in the bank, or 40 billion dollars in the bank? How can they go to sleep at night knowing that there are children that are going to bed hungry, that the school system, so the things that we need to build up a better society, have no funding, yet they have all this 
money they could never use in a lifetime. Now, I don't remember the specifics about it, but back in the 70s, there was this little article published that if I were a millionaire and I stood on a street corner and I gave out, I think it was a $100 bill, every minute, how many years it would take for me to run through that, especially with interest accumulating. And if I remember correctly, now, I wish I could research this because I, I didn't do it, so I'm talking off the cuff now. But it was like, like 300 years, and most of us are living day to day. So I don't understand how a person of conscience can do that uh, to the world around them. It just makes no, no sense to me. And I think a little bit, not so much about the millionaires and billionaires, but about the rest of us. So yesterday we had a conversation with a friend, and he was talking to us about a real estate seminar he had recently gone to about how you can buy property, and it wasn't clear whether it was to buy it to fix it up to rent it or to buy it to resell to somebody else at a profit, and that continuing process would, you know, put money in your pocket, would help you accumulate wealth. Many people watch the house flipping programs on television. Occasionally, I've had the terrible misfortune of being somewhere where that those programs are on. And what it left me thinking is, how about the rest of us, those of us who aren't millionaires or billionaires, who may be doing those kinds of things and not even realizing the negative impact we are having on poor people. And I, I think it behooves us all to think about what we do and how we do it and what impact we're having on others. And um, with that in mind, we thought we would just look at what some of the other, um, what, are the, what, what are some of the other issues, what are the is, that are interconnected with poverty, either are a contributing factor toward poverty or because you're poor, it's so much more difficult to navigate these systems. And one of the first ones that popped us for, up for us, probably because of last week's show when we discussed racism, was institutional racism that disenfranchises one group and makes them less able to attain employment, housing, resources, resources and certainly accumulate wealth. One of the things I've read in the past two days was, again, something about home ownership, how for many families, wealth starts with the home they own. I came across a statistic that the average value of a home owned by a person of color is $31,000, yet it's $126,000 for a white family. Now that's an incredible disparity, and when it comes to taking the wealth from that home, the equity in that home, and turning it into more wealth, you can certainly see how the wealth is going to accumulate for one group and not for another. I already talked about the GI Bill, and I see that as one of the ways, certainly redlining the inner cities, and then until there was a fair housing law, not allowing people of color to move into the suburban areas where this practically free money was available. But there's more than just the housing. There's job opportunities. We all know that if two people are vying for a job and one is white and one is not white, we can guess who's most likely to be offered that position. And policing practices, public wow. education disparities, there are so many things, and we're going to try to get into a little bit of depth with some of these, and we're going to tell you right up front that we did try to do some research on the local situation, and it was very difficult to find local statistics. So a lot of what we're going to talk about is the view from the top, the view, view from you know the whole country, and many of it is quite applicable to here. Maybe some of it isn't. We're certainly not going to give up on this issue, though. We're going to pursue this one further. One of the important issues for me is this policing issue. Savannah has a big problem with policing. Uh, everyone thinks, or not everyone, some people think that the answer to crime is police. The answer to crime is more cameras. The answer to crime is more police precincts and more cops on the road. Um, I differ with that. The, uh, they say, well, we have, we have crime 
And the way to solve the, the crime is to get the criminals out of the way. Actually, it was Aristotle who said some, uh, what was it, 2,300 years ago that cr uh, poverty is the mother of crime. Not, not uh, a, a person who has generally doesn't go out to take from someone else. It's, it's when society has promised you things, made you a dream, and then they deny that dream to you that you become disconnected. So crime, if you really want to work on solving the problem of crime in Savannah, work on solving the problem of poverty. No one is talking about poverty. They're talking about all these police equipment and gear and the militarization of the police department, training and riot control. If we got rid of the problem of poverty, we probably wouldn't need riot control. There wouldn't be any. Almost every riot has taken place in areas that are known for uh, extreme poverty. And the and in fact, I haven't heard of too many riots out on Skidaway Island. Have no, you? I haven't either. I haven't either. Of course, I'm a newcomer. Maybe they're there. <laughs> but I want to talk about the flip side of not only is poverty a significant cause of crime, but our policing practices are causing greater distress on impoverished neighborhoods. I'm sure you've all heard of the war on drugs. And, I mean, that's been going on for 40-plus years. And um, it's targeted mostly to inner-city neighborhoods. And many of you will think, well, that's where the drug action is. That's where it's all happening. And I can tell you that the statistics tell you that it, that is nonsense. The use of drugs, the sale of drugs, is about the equivalent of the percentage of people who live in this country. Yet it certainly wouldn't appear that way from the arrests. The police go into impoverished neighborhoods. They stop people on the street. They ask them what they have in their pocket. Now, in many places, carrying drugs concealed is not a crime. But yet it's not unusual for the police to say, show me what's in your pocket. And as soon as those drugs are revealed, that becomes the criminal activity. So if you use the war on drugs as a way to go into poor neighborhoods to stop and frisk people, you're certainly going to see a higher level of drug crime in those neighborhoods. The other policing practice is called the broken windows policing. And um, maybe it's a more prevalent tactic in larger cities, but I think not. And basically what broken windows says is there's going to be more crime in, um, in, in, in neighborhoods that where the housing is very de deteriorated, where pe very poor people live. And, of course, that's where it gets its name, Broken Windows, because most of the windows in those homes are broken. So that's where you target your police. If you target your police to a certain neighborhood, that's where you're going to identify criminal activity. And then your crime statistics are going to say, oh, look, there's more crime in this neighborhood than that neighborhood. That's where we need to target our police activities. So it becomes this vicious circle. And this over-policing of poor neighborhoods creates absolute havoc for poor people. People who are arrested and can't make bail and languish in jail waiting for their court appearances. People impoverished who can't hire their own attorneys and have to rely on assigned counsel. And we, we know what, what, um, how much attention often is paid by assigned counsel to the poorer people. We know poor people are encouraged to plea bargain, not to demand their day in court. And these plea bargains often come with a jail sentence, with a felony conviction. And then once one gets out of prison, does their time, unless there is a policy of ban the box in a community, People do have to say right on the very initial job application that, yes, they have been arrested and convicted of a felony. And in case you have never heard of Ban the Box, what it does is take that little box off the initial job application and gives the person at least the opportunity to apply for a job, be considered, be interviewed, and then if they're going to be considered for the job, the employer does have the opportunity to do a background check. And for many people, once you get to that point in employment process, an employer will look up and say, oh, my God, when he was 17, he was convicted of carrying a bag of marijuana in his pocket. But I'm convinced that he's perfectly qualified for this job, and I'm going to hire him. So policing tactics 
have such an impact on people's lives. If you've been accused of a felony, you can't live in public housing. And there are, I'm sure, other ways in which this these policing tactics have a ne- negative impact on crime. They Many times we know the police are doing more harm going into poor neighborhoods than the good that they're intending to do. At well, least. Again, this is a, as, as a process of the rich taking advantage of the poor. Uh, who's making money off these prisons now that almost all of them are privatized? Even the probation departments are privatized. You have to pay for your probation. You have to pay. Uh, prisons that are privatized are using you as as labor for their own benefit because they're making money off you being in jail. And it's like a hotel, you know, it's occupancy that makes it profitable or not. So if it's uh, crime is going waning, going down, there's some way that they have to come up with people to fill that. This was true in the South, even during the old chain gangs when they wanted people to, to do certain work. They had to make things that are not a crime a crime in order to get the people to put onto the chain gangs. And uh, there was even talk recently of bringing some of these chain gangs back. The illusion that we have that the police are there to protect us is still rampant. And even according to the Supreme Court ruling, the police have no obligation to either serve or protect you. That is not their primary function. Their primary function is purely enforcement of the law, and we don't make the laws. There are people who sit on councils and on boards that make all the laws. Nobody asks us, generally, and uh, there's never a referendum on anything. In fact, states don't or cities don't like referendums because then the people have a say. As long as they can sit there, nine people governing 150,000 people, and they make the decisions— we are victims, you might say, and especially when it comes to things like budgets, police budgets. This new administration that came in, first thing they wanted to do was more money for uh, the p- police because Savannah was definitely mired in crime. They didn't recognize Savannah is actually mired in poverty, and that's where the resources and the money needs to be put, not in policing, but in helping people up out of poverty, leveling the playing field. But it seems the only way we're going to be able to do that is to get rid of the rich. (laughs) Right. Some people think that education is a step up and out of poverty. We're not quite so sure it's um, the latter that many people think it is. Nevertheless, when you look at public education, that K-12 education, we all know the disparities between the wealthier schools and the poorer schools. So the privatization of education has certainly benefited wealthy kids more so than poorer kids. Charter schools, you can't select who comes in the door. You have to do it by a lottery, but you certainly can select who goes out the door. So it's not unusual for a charter school to make demands on kids and their families that poor people can't possibly meet. And so the poor kids are sent out, sent back to the public schools, and there then you have the charters full of the more fortunate kids, the kids with more resources. Federal programs such as No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top um, are responsible for the absurd testing of kids in grades three to eight, and then using those test scores to rate teachers, administrators, and schools, and as was recently approved for Georgia, forced disciplinary actions on those schools that failed to meet the test standards, such as being taken over, being taken out of the hands of the public and a publicly elected board of education and put in the hands of a manager. None of this benefits poor kids. Most kids, for instance, you know, if you go to school and, and you graduate even class valedictorian, uh, the chances of you going to college are nil for most students unless you can get a scholarship somewhere. So again, you're dependent on the charity of the rich or of corporations, whether they're going to fund it or not, because you're not getting the help you need from the schools themselves, which would society benefits when we have a well-educated uh, population. But of course, the rich don't. Uh, some of the things that we, we learned today is it, how expensive it is. When I was in, in school, it wasn't nearly <laughs> expensive. It is now a shock to learn that a year at the University of Georgia, you know, it can run 30000 bucks, 22 to 30000 bucks. How many children or people do you know have that? 
So they, what do they do? They have to go into debt again. Many of them mortgage their homes, uh, do everything to get their children, give their children this opportunity. And if you're out of state and want to come to the University of Georgia, it can be up to almost $50,000 a year for the same period. It's just uh, amazing that, that this is allowed to happen. Now, there are other opportunities, of course, other than that, and they possibly should be the, uh, uh, explored more. The idea that everyone has to go to college is not accurate because we have friends that are baristas that have college degrees, you know. And and so it doesn't mean you're going to succeed right. or that you're going to have the opportunity because the jobs aren't there. And, and are struggling to pay their college loans. <laughs> and even technical schools. I mean, the cost of an average technical school to get a skill is anywhere between three and $6,000. My son became a firefighter in the state of Florida. Now, where I'm from up north, if you get accepted for training as a firefighter, it you you are sent the city pays for your training and then you're obligated to stay in the force for a certain period of time but where he was in the state of florida you had to put up i think three or four thousand dollars to go through the fire academy just to be able to qualify to be hired for a job and i was willing to co-sign his loan because here he is a young kid with um no borrowing capacity and i remember asking him one day what do poor kids do? What do poor kids whose families can't co-sign a loan because they don't have the collateral for that co-sign? And he said, gee, Mom, I don't know. They probably just don't go. And isn't that just incredibly sad? This brings about so many problems for not only us, the richest country in the world, but for the other rich industrialized nations. And more importantly, for those nations that have not reached that status. So while we've been sitting here, and we didn't even dis discuss half of what we wanted to, but while we've been sitting here for this hour, it's estimated that um, six people every minute, every minute dies from starvation. So that's 360 people since we've been sitting here, and that's 8,640 people a day. And sadly enough, it's the children that are affected the most. Uh, so in the, that it's just a, uh, what are we doing with this wealth? That was my point with the billionaires sitting in all this money. What are we doing with this wealth? If we aren't doing something instructive and something good, then we're doing something that we should not be doing. And the problem is not the poor, which everyone wants to say, oh, they're poor, it's their fault. I've got news. It's not their fault. It's the fault of those who have, not those who have not. Right. And... Yeah, we could we could go on talking about this, um, talking more about food, about people living in food debt, food deserts, um, poverty in this country and housing. around the world, housing, and health care. So we live in a country with that has an insurer based system. We don't have health care. We have, if we're lucky, health insurance. When the Affordable Care Act was passed. Everybody was required to buy a policy, whether they could afford it or not. Um, and many people could afford, or could only afford policies they couldn't afford to use because of co-pays. Most people couldn't afford to buy the top of the line at all. And we're now hearing that they we're anticipating cuts in Medicaid, in Medicare, the, um, you know, the, the more safety nets. So, again, we could talk about this for a very long time. Now, all this is true, though. Well, we discovered uh, a, a list of the insurance companies. Now, this yes. is why the ACA or this new bill, it doesn't matter to us so much because the health insurance, the, we, there's still people who can't afford it. The, what was it? Which one was it? Uh, Cigna, Cigna? The Cigna CEO, David Cordani, his total compensation for a year is $49 million. United Healthcare CEO Stephen Hemsley, sixty-six million. Centene CEO Michael Needoff, twenty-two million. Aetna CEO Mark Bertolini, twenty-seven point nine million. And poor Joseph Swedish, <laughs> the CEO of Anthem, only makes sixteen point five million a year. Poor baby. I don't Stick know how in he there, keeps he'll up. Grow up. I don't know how he keeps up with his counterparts. So meanwhile, it's 6.59. We need to say goodbye. We haven't yet finished the entire conversation on poverty, but we certainly will revisit it.
Thank you so much for listening. Please tune in next week when we talk about the decimation of the Southern Forest with guest Vicki Weeks of the Dogwood Alliance. So thank you for listening to Voices of Resistance.